thank you for being here today. Hope I'll be able to say some things you'll find useful and that'll be an interesting session too. So what, what are some of the um, reasons that it's worth, worthwhile to write in sci about science in a way that's accessible, a way that's easily understandable? Right, so it's, it's a, one of the responsibilities as a scientist to communicate. If you don't communicate it, you might as well not have done the work. You know, public needs to be understand about science, I think, but probably both on the sort of the more policy level you're talking about, and sometimes on making personal decisions are based on an understanding of science and technology, too. You know, writing accessibly will help non-specialists to understand, so it can participate in policy decisions and personal decisions. Um, I think writing accessibly can be especially important if non-native speakers of English are reading. And a large part of the world um, scientific community consists of people whose native language isn't English, many of whom are self-taught and um, important to try to get the barriers down. It helps other readers too. I mean, it may be someone who's you know, a native speaker and knows the science, let's say a grant reviewer, but people are busy. And if things are written accessibly, you can under, understand them well. I think it establishes rapport, too, if one writes in a way that's under, understandable. It minimizes misinterpretation, which I think is really important. I know sometimes people come talk to me. They've heard back from the peer reviewers of their paper. And they say, well, they missed this point. Well, maybe the point wasn't worded accessibly. So, and similarly, minimizes editorial distortion. I know, again, sometimes people will complain and say, well, the editor distorted what I was trying to say. But maybe it wasn't said clearly, so it was open to misinterpretation. To me, I think also writing accessibly clarifies one's own thinking. That sometimes trying to explain something clearly to someone else, rather than just using a lot of boilerplate jargon, really makes aids in sort of seeing, seeing the relationships and understanding. And so I'm going to present um, some pointers for writing accessibly. And let me first give some caveats, in other words, some sort of reservations, some limitations. One is these are guidelines, not rules. You know, they generally apply, but I think all of us can probably think of exceptions, so that, you know, they shouldn't be applied rigidly. I think it's as many things in writing. It's writing is sort of problem solving, and there are often several solutions with different pluses and minuses, and this is, these are some of the things to consider. I think some of what I'm going to say is you know, well supported by empirical research. Others are basically things that make sense and that people do, and you sort of notice that the light goes on when you do them. Perhaps if I were to say one theme of, of these pointers, and I probably should have put it on the slides, it's right to communicate, not to impress. I think often people in, you know, in scientific or technical fields, graduate fields, feel that in order to seem authoritative, in order to seem educated, you've got to say things in a fancy and ponderous way with lots of long sentences and long words. You, I mean, if you're a graduate student, you've already done well on the GRE. You don't have to use your GRE words. And so don't, you know, don't try to impress. My feeling is that when somebody reads something that is accessibly written, their feeling should be, wow, wasn't that clear and interesting? It shouldn't be, well, I really don't understand it, but they really sounded smart. <laughs> and so I think the important thing is, is communicate. And I think some of the people who I consider some of the very best communicators are like that. I don't know if any of you know, know of Bruce Alberts. Um, Bruce was head of National Academy of Sciences for many years. Before that, he was a professor of biochemistry at UCSF. He's just been named the editor of science. And I was lucky enough, we overlapped times at UCSF, and I used to sit in on some of Bruce's lectures. Very modest, unassuming guy who pre, you know, would take really tough molecular biology and just present it really simply. So again, I'm going to give some general pointers and then move to pointers for specific groups. Um, one, one thing I would say for accessibility is give people different routes of access into what you're writing. 
you know, some people will be captured by the title, but not everybody. So if you can get, have various things that will grab people's attention, that's a way to get people in. One, obviously, is a good title. And particularly, given the indexing and abstracting services in science, you need a title where people will be able to tell what you're going to be writing about. So a good, clear title is important. Same thing for writing for the public, good title. Um, an abstract, if it's a scientific paper that will draw people in, really important. Or if it's writing for the public, sometimes there's a, a sentence or two blurb under the title. And that can draw people in. The introduction, or in journalistic writing the lead, again, that's a place that can, people can be drawn in. Headings, I think a lot of us are skimmers. And if we see a heading that has something that interests us, it'll draw people in. Graphics, really important. If they're good graphics, that is often what will attract a person. In journalistic writing, there may be what's known as pull quotes. Um, it, for example, you'll see um, in larger type an excerpt from the article, like a sentence that's really catchy. And sometimes people read that and be drawn in. Um, italics or boldface can help attract people. If they're used sparingly, if they're overused, it's, it's like noise. And in journalistic writing, sometimes sidebars. In other words, a little article on a related topic that runs with the big one can, can draw people in. So I think in writing something, think, think about all the different parts that can attract your readers. And that those can be roots, roots of access. And I think something that's related and uses some of these same um, devices is making the structure clear at a glance. Ideally, a person can just look at something and say, OK, yeah, this is a scientific paper. I can find the methods right here. Or this is a review article. I can see how it's laid out. So um, making the structure clear, I think, gives people access. Headings are helpful. For some kinds of writing, you can use bullet points. And often, just some white space between sections can provide breathing room and help people. In general, avoid long paragraphs and long sentences. Think long paragraphs, it's like people can't breathe. I don't know about you. Sometimes I'll see something that has this huge long paragraph that runs an entire column. I don't even want to start approaching it. Or if I start approaching it, I get lost in the middle. So often. I find often in drafts I'll end up with long paragraphs, but then I will, I will break them up. Same thing in sent, long sentences. I find often in my rough drafts I'll have long meandering sentences with parentheses within parentheses within parentheses, and, yeah, and footnotes within footnotes within footnotes, and nobody could follow them. So I need to go back, break them up into manageable length sentences, and makes it, makes it more accessible for people. Another pointer is to minimize use of jargon, in other words, specialized terminology. Obviously, if you are writing for peers, colleagues in your field, you will want to and need to use some specialized terminology. And, th and that's right, and, it's a bet and it actually makes it more accessible. But sometimes people will um, use more jargon than is needed. Or if they're writing for the public, they will use you know, a lot of jargon. I think particularly if you're working in a field, you may assume that everybody you know, knows you know, what, what something is. But not everybody does. So I think minimizing jargon. And um, remembering to define unfamiliar terms. I and mean, if there are terms that people may not know, um, de de defining them. Sometimes defining them is um, more, is better than just avoiding them. It was interesting. There was an article actually in press in, some, in a publication I edited. And it's about um, what's known as the patient page in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And this is the last um, page of the journal. And it's a page that um, provides information intended for patients. 
And originally, they were trying to avoid using technical terms and put everything in lay terms. They did some focus groups. And actually, the patient said, we want to learn you know, the proper technical terms so that when our doctors use them, we can. So now they do include the technical terms, but they're very careful to define, define everything. I, another big one, I think, is minimizing use of abbreviations and acronyms. I think that can be one of the most confusing things that uh, people will use a lot of abbreviations, a lot of acronyms, never define them, use non-standard ones, make up their own that nobody else uses. And it's just all these capital letters swirling, swirling around, and people just get lost. And so I think this is a place where longer can be better very often writing things out in full. I mean, if, you're, if there are abbreviations or acronyms that everybody in your readership knows, use them. Or you know, maybe for one or two or three things that are new to people that you use again and again. But I find in editing, one of the main things I do is convert abbreviations and acronyms to full terms, because it can just be confusing. And I think this can be especially confusing in presentations, because if it's in text, people can look it up. But I've just seen people just sit there during presentations and just get totally lost because they didn't understand a key acronym or abbreviation. Another general pointer is to write simply and concisely. Obviously, there are technical terms you need to use. But for the non-technical things, condense it, write in a simple, simple, direct way. One of the nice things about this is it can also help you meet page limits or word limits. I find a lot of times colleagues will come to me and say, well, for this journal, papers are supposed to be no more than 3,000 words. I've got 3,500 words. I, what can I do? And I find I can usually get rid of those 500 words just by cutting out needless words or condensing wordy phrases. And don't lo lose any of their ideas. One thing is very often it's helpful just to, instead of the big word, to use the simple common word. So instead of attempt, what could you say? Try, Try right. Instead of fundamental, basic. basic, good. Another thing you, um, you can often do is delete needless words. Instead of saying red in color, red, red right. Or instead of totally destroyed, Right, right. And, um, and there are a lot of wordy phrases people use that can be condensed. How about at this point in time? Now, right. And in the event that, if, if right. So get that down to, to so to, get it down to two letters. And another thing is a lot of times people in the sciences or in administrative or technical fields will use nouns instead of verbs. and by changing things back to the verb, you can be a lot more concise, and it can sound a lot more powerful, too. So instead of produce relief of, relieve. And instead of provide an explanation, explain, right? I think one thing that can make things more accessible and more interesting to people is including human interest. Often, members of the public may not be that interested in the abstract concepts, but they're interested, well, how does it affect people? How are people involved? And I think in science, often writing for the public, if you can talk about the researchers, or the health professionals, or the users of the technology, or the patients, or um, the policy makers, bring, bring people into the writing, which may be something quite different from, let's say, in a scientific paper or a grant proposal, but in writing for the public, human interest can add a lot. And something that is, I think, closely related is using some narrative. People love stories. Stories can make things clearer. And put those people into the stories. The researchers, well, you know, how do they find what they found? Or the patient, what, what was the story of what happened? with the patient. And actually, narrative also, although it may not be obvious, really a scientific paper is the story of the research. Or a grant proposal is sort of the story of the research you want to do. And so basically, by trying to make it a cohesive story, it will make it more accessible. 
Something else that I think can be very important, very useful for the public, is providing overviews before details. Fellow experts may know the big picture, and so you can start with a little part, and people will know how it fits in. Remember, the public may not know, so you may need an overview first. You know, this medication can have three groups of side effects. Okay, so now we know we're talking about side effects, and you can expect the three groups. So providing an overview before details to orient people. I think something else that's really helpful with the public is relating unfamiliar things to familiar things. For example, by providing analogies. Uh, there's one article that I really like for the public, and it talks about the body's mechanism in the hypothalamus for regulating the body's temperature. And, and it said it works sort of like a thermostat. Well, you know, most of us are used to turning up and down a thermostat, things like that. So analogies, I think, can be useful, or other ways of rela relating sizes to familiar sizes. Is that I'm building bridges. That it's not that people don't know things. They may not know what talking about, but figure out what they know about, what they care about, um, what, their, you know, what their schemas are, how they organize information, and then build a bridge with what I want to tell them. And I, I like that image much better. I know there's another image that's often used called watering things down. And I think to water things down, that I think is sort of a condescending way of looking at things. And also, I find when people water things down, you sort of end up with these undigestible chunks in sort of an insipid broth. And so not wa watering things down, build, build bridges. I think something else, include examples. Concrete examples of how things work can be very helpful. Some of you may be um, familiar with essays by Lewis Thomas, um, very fine scientist, essayist. And he, he, he was a master of that. Um, for example, he, would, he has a wonderful essay called Germs, where he talks about you know, how most germs aren't helpful and how they just sort of mind their own business, and then gives, gives various examples. Another thing, if appropriate, intersperse what I sometimes call goodies. Um, things that where people just sort of say, that's neat, like a good quote, or a good example, or a neat little factoid. And, and I think that tends to keep public reading. I know I used to um, do some freelance writing for, for Woman's World magazine. And what I would all sort of go through when I was, would be going through a draft, I'd put actually a little check mark in the margin wherever there was you know, a quote or anecdote or neat little thing. And I'd try to make sure that you know, every so often there would be something. And if I'd see that I'd gone a couple pages, manuscript pages without anything, I'd try to see what I could bring in so that there'd be interesting things sort of sprinkled through to keep, keep people going. The article for public is like a chocolate chip cookie. And every bite should have at least one chocolate chip. Another thing we talked earlier about for the um, public, it, um, it can be helpful to include some technical terms. But often it's helpful to introduce them gently. Because if you just throw terms at people, even if the definition's lighter, people can panic and say, am I supposed to know this? This is too hard for me. Very often, if you can put the concept first and then give it a name, you know, it's more, more accessible. The first example is from the um, JAMA, patient, a JAMA patient page. So they said, complete loss of kidney function, comma, known as end-stage renal disease. So people know what they're talking about first, and then it's given a name. Or the, uh, another one is, um, some of you may um, be familiar with writing by Adil Gawande. He wrote a book called Complications and a new one called Better. He, he writes medical articles that appear in The New Yorker and elsewhere, and he's very good. An example from his writing is the involuntary or autonomic nervous system. So putting the concept first and then the term. I think another thing that is helpful for the public is um, making relationships clear. If you're writing for your peers, the people reviewing your grant proposal, they'll probably know relationships of ideas. For the public, often they will not have the background to make that jump. So sometimes making the reasoning explicit, you know, this and therefore this and therefore this, rather than jumping from the first to the third. 
And also, I think, using transitions effectively, again, because people don't know relationships. So again, first, second, third, or however, or nevertheless, you know, that, that kind of thing. So people will know, will know the relationships. Another thing in making science accessible to the public is to present numbers and sizes effectively. I think um, one, um, one thing is using familiar units. I think it's unfortunate, but most members of the US public are not familiar with the metric system. And present something in the metric system, won't understand it. So often have to use English units either instead or in addition. Otherwise, people are likely to be confused. And I think um, comparing sizes with sizes of familiar items, because again, even if it's given in familiar units, if it said, you know, so and so many inches by so and so many inches, you know, maybe hard, but you know, say, size of a lipstick or a size of a soda can. I think another thing is countering misconceptions respectfully, that there are a lot of myths, and a lot of them are very plausible things, but they're not right. And um, Kathy Rowan, who I believe is now at George Mason, has done some work on this and come up with a sort of a protocol for countering misconceptions, basically sort of stating the common belief. And, but then, rather than saying, well, this makes no sense, or you know, how can anybody believe that, you know, sh acknowledging the plausibility, you know, sort of saying, well, you know, it would be reasonable to expect that, you know, given such and such, but then show the inadequacy of the belief, and then show the merits of the more um, scientifically founded view. Doing these things probably makes it easier for everybody to read use largely subject verb object sentence structure having unusual sentence structures can can be confusing to anybody but particularly to the you know the poor person who has taught herself or himself um, English and another thing is often use mainly simple verb forms unusual verb forms can be can be confusing and I think a lot of us just use them wrong so there's a book that came out a couple of years ago called The Elements of International English Style, and I'll provide the reference in a little while. And that has a lot of pointers for people in science or business or other fields who are writing for international readerships. Try not to use words that have a lot of meanings, because people may be confused or have the wrong meaning. And so as an example of that, I, you know, when I was writing this, I said, even if doing so means using a longer word. And I thought, wait a minute, means has a lot of meanings. So I changed it to even if doing so requires using a longer word, which has a specific, and that, and there are a lot of words like that, like the word address can mean several things. And so I'm going to address, you know, address this. Well, are you going to write the address on it? Are you going to analyze it? Are you going to solve it? I think another thing um, is to be aware, beware of literary allusions, sports metaphors, things like that, when there are cultural differences, or even within our own culture. You know, I think you know, some people you know, may assume, well, everybody's familiar with Shakespeare. But maybe within our own culture, there isn't. Or and there are a lot of people who make biblical allusions. But not everybody's really familiar with the Bible. And I think sports metaphors, too. Um, I found, often on the wards, clinically, I found, people would always be using all these sports metaphors. And you know, the poor international medical graduate you know, for whom you know, football is soccer and isn't familiar with American baseball. And you know, they don't, you know, if the, if the players are on base, you know, well, what's going on here, whatever. So, so I think being careful not, not to use um, sort of images that are culturally bound. I would say beware of irony and humor. Often they will not translate. And I think often even within one's own culture in writing about science. Sometimes it, it will backfire. So I would say unless you know the sense of humor of the people you're working with, um, beware of it. Another thing is to write dates in formats that are not prone to misinterpretation. Different country, I mean, let's say if you write 5 January 2008, I think you know, everybody would know what's meant. 
but 1508. In some countries, it's January 5th. In other countries, it's May 1st. Sometimes it can be helpful to retain some of the optional words um, if they make it clearer what's, what's meant. I think often in journalism, we're told, if there's a that that isn't absolutely necessary, take it out. But sometimes the that will make it clearer. I believe Dr. Ballister will call a meeting. Well, people start reading the sentence, I believe Dr. might think I'm, I believe Dr. Ballister, not I'm believing that she's calling a meeting. So often the structure may be clearer to some readers if I say, I believe that Dr. Ballister will call a meeting. So sometimes the most concise is not the best. I mean, the most important thing is clear, clarity. And if you need a few more words to make it clear, use them. Another um, suggestion um, you, from, from Weiss is to guide readers, punctuate liberally. You know, there's some times where you could do without the punctuation, but it's often, let's say, serial comma. In other words, if you have a list, blank, blank, and blank. You know, some people will do, you know, blank, comma, blank, and blank. Others, the blank, com blank, comma, blank, comma, and blank. And often, if the second um, comma is there, it can be clearer. There are some compound words that you can either hyphenate or not. And he says often if you hyphenate them, it's, actually, it's clearer to a lot of readers. And that doesn't mean use unnecessary punctuation. But often if, the, if there's optional punctuation and it will make clearer how things are structured, use the optional. And I found that this, this book was very good. It had a lot of good examples and things. And so I would recommend it. One of the parts that I thought was, was really fun and really well done was on writing letters in different countries and how there are, are different, different formats and different expectations. And, and for example, Americans tend to be fairly direct in their business letters, whereas in other, some other countries, one will lead up to things much less, less directly. Good writing is basically good editing. It's a matter of going over and over. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure.